Many islanders know of Emma Veery, the elegant singer who once headlined the best Waikiki showrooms. But do you know that as a child, she lived at the Waikiki Natatorium with her family and more than 20 at-risk boys? Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii, inviting you to join me for a conversation with a few surprises. Singer Emma Viri has lived an extraordinary life. We'll share stories with this Nahoku Hanohano Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Emma Viri, next. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Emma Viri's strongest influence was her late mother, Nana Viri, a pure Hawaiian woman raised in traditional ways. Nana Viri dedicated her life to a spiritual journey, and she loved everyone, including the rich and famous and the homeless. At one time, Nana took in so many boys, today we'd call them at-risk youth, that the family actually moved out of its rented home in Kapahulu and into the Waikiki Natatorium. You were a small family. A small family of five. In blood, but not in terms of oh, relatives. A huge <laughs> family, uh, you know, Hanai here, Hanai there, all these people. Mother would bring uh, kids home who were on the brink of delinquent being delinquents and help straighten them out. And one story is, you know, one day, one evening, my dad comes home and it was, everyone was asleep already and we had a little two bedroom home. Where was this? This was in Kapahulu on Wainam Avenue. And we had this little two bedroom home and dad and mom slept in one bedroom and the three kids slept in the other bedroom and we were all grown, you know, we were teenagers. And uh, he comes home, the lights were out, everybody was asleep. And we hear this crash, bang, and this cursing and cussing. <laughs> My mother had brought home about 21 boys who were on the brink of, you know, having problems. 21? And they were all asleep in our living room. And dad fell over all of these bodies that were asleep, and he didn't know who was there or what was happening. He, it was panicking. And here mother had said, oh, that's all right, dad. I, these boys are having problems. I brought them home. They don't have a place to stay, to live. So here we are with all these kids there. Were there she, unlimited resources to feed uh, all no, these mouths? Oh, no, no, no. We just, uh, they'd go ahead and everybody, Whatever we had, you eat. If we don't have, you don't have. So these boys, 21 strong, come yeah, to your yeah. small house, house in yeah. Kapahulu. Right. Rented house? Yes, rented house. And the landlord, how was, how'd the landlord feel about that? You know, that? in those days, nobody, nobody cared. It was interesting, it was interesting, because when I was little, we used to be within 20 feet of the road and the sidewalk on a main thoroughfare. And we would take our pillows and blanket and our little goza mats, and go and sleep out all night long. They can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But this is a, what Hawaii was many, many years ago, and I miss it. But, you know, in those days, things were different. Things were different. How else um, is life different now, do you think, than when you were growing up? Oh, my goodness. Oh, gee, I gotta watch my mouth now. <laughs> I don't know. The, the values aren't the same. The values are not the same. And uh, when, when the 21 boys moved in that, that oh, night and, and yeah. in subsequent days, your mom wasn't worried about you as this uh, pretty uh, no, uh, no, teenager in the house? They used to, it, the boys used to take care of us. It, it was a different time than it is today. It was absolutely amazing. They adored us, you know, and we had our favorites. And they would, uh, you know, uh, uh, we'd con them into doing all the work that we had to do, you know. and. Uh, no, there was, and the boys came and went. People would come and go f our lives. Nobody just stayed. Can you, can you share with us some names that perhaps we might know? Well, we had, we had, uh, um, um, we had Keo Nakama there. Well, Johnny Costello, we had. Who's a musician. Jimmy, Jimmy Kaku, who was also a musician and a singer, and uh, Richard Cowhey. He was an excellent, excellent pianist. He was way ahead of his time and he loved jazz. 
and he played music, beautiful jazz, and he's quite an icon. Well, were most of the boys the musicians? Horn. Was that the common bond, or was the common bond being footless and having yeah. world, nothing else to <laughs> a do? A lot footless, but a lot, uh, uh, there were musicians. I'm trying to relate to your family moving to the natatorium <laughs> with all these boys. How did that happen? What was that like? Well, we had rented a home, and the people who owned the home, their daughter was coming back, and they wanted the home for her, so we had to vacate. So mother, who was working at the natatorium at the time with Walter Napoleon, said, Mr. Napoleon, I need time off. I have to find a place to live. He says, a what do you mean? She said, well, there, we have to give up our house and find an, he said, don't go anywhere. He says, you just stay here at work. I'll fix it up for you. And what did she do at the uh, natatorium? What was her job? She was the matron of the natatorium, whatever that meant. And she would hand out the towels and the keys and everything. But she was also the lifeguard matron. She didn't know how to swim. <laughs> she said, I don't know how they gave me that. I can't even swim. She said, oh, here I am, the head of the lifeguards. But um, he said, OK, Hannah, we have three rooms underneath the bleachers. He said, and one bedroom for the, the children, bedroom for you and Barney, and one for just like a living, you know, and kitchen. And then we walked right outside from being under the bleachers, and there was a little bathroom, private bathroom for us. But did he know you were going to bring all those boys? Well, the boys were beach boys. A lot of them were from the beach. So they would be, they would go home to their families. They had families. Oh. But they were, you know, Nana was the only one that could, could make them toe the line. And uh, so they would come and, you know, visit and go. And we used to, uh, the first thing we did in the morning was jump in the water and swim. The last thing we did at night was jump in the water and swim before we went to bed. And because the bleachers, we never spent time in those bedrooms. The bleachers were heated from the sun, warm. We would just lay our mat there. After we jumped out of the water, we'd get a towel, towel to ourselves, lay down. We didn't need any blankets or anything because it was warm from the sun, the day's sun. You know, in my lifetime, I have swum in the natatorium. Oh, my gosh. But I don't recall it as being particularly clean. No. It, it, uh, was it clean back then? Well, um, I don't know because it, was, they, it wasn't it was um, concrete on the bottom. It was sand. It was sand. It was, they built it on the sand, and I don't think they ever... It wasn't like a regular pool that has a bottom on it, mm -hmm. because we used to go down and pick up sand and bring it up, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and the water just came in through the side, mm -hmm. the holes in the side, and would just, so overnight it would more or less clean itself out. And then, you know, everybody would come swimming, and that night the, the waves would come in and the tide would just clear. You know, but you couldn't see the bottom. And, and over time, I'm sure it got oh, I'm uh, sure, I'm sure. Yes, more and yes. more uh, right. deteriorated condition. And at that time, they were having uh, uh, swimming meets there, too. And uh, I know Ohio State used to come over. That's uh, where a lot of the Hawaiian boys went to school. And um, they used to have the meets there while we were there. So it was big time. Yes, yes. Oh, and we used to have fun because we lived under the bleachers. We just go home and we didn't have to go anywhere at night. You, know? you didn't feel a loss of privacy or wishing for the kind of homes your friends no, had. No, never. We were just very happy with our lot, you know, and and grateful. And, and your mother says in her book that that was probably the happiest time ever for yes. her. Yes, and I was going to come in Maya at the time too, at one point, and I take the bus and go to come in Maya school and then come home to the natatorium. <laughs> <laughs>Emma Veery loves sharing stories about her family, especially her mother, Nana Veery, who wrote this book, Change We Must, chronicling her spiritual journey. Nana immersed herself in Hawaiian theology, then Christian Pentecostalism, and Zen Buddhism, literally traveling the globe in her quest for spiritual truths. Your mother negotiated so many changes in her life. In fact, she seemed to do so effortlessly. She went from revering nature and speaking yes. to the Hawaiian deity figures right. to Christian Pentecostalism. Oh, gosh, yes. To <laughs> metaphysics. <laughs> you know, um, she, she seemed to uh, have the two belief systems coexist. She, she still believed in the Hawaiian way, yes, and yes, when she went to neighbor yes. islands, she would ask the guardian spirits to allow yes. her to come and uh -huh. partake of the joy of the islands. Mm -hmm. And yet she believed in the Christian God. Um, 
in the past, people had said, you got to pick, you know, Queen no. Kaahumanu, Hawaiian ways out, Christian ways in. No. But she seemed to she, she wanted, both. Yes, and this was her whole journey to just balance, put them all in balance and take a little bit from each and put them all together and make her own little thing, which is what we live by and I've lived by and I still do live by. A little bit of this and a little bit of that and make your own thing. I think that was her whole journey is, getting everything she could possibly learn about spirit and, and religion, etc., and, and putting it all together and making this one thing that she could work with. We, we know yeah. um, Nana Viri as this yes. uh, renowned spiritualist who, who, whom people came from far and wide to consult and see and spend time with. Right. What was she like as a mom starting out when you were a little baby? I mean, she was just, you know, she was just our mom. That was it. And interestingly enough, when we grew old enough, we chose to go on her spiritual path with her. And that's what made life most interesting. Because whatever she was studying, we were studying. And we were chanting in Chinese, Japanese, Tibetan, or whatever she was doing. We were doing it. So we've, we were living her life, her book, with her, which I still do. You know, for all of her life, she was in tune spiritually and went on these journeys for truth. How did right. you and, and your brother and sister fit in? Well, you know, again, we, we all joined uh, emotionally, spiritually with her in her journey. And she'd come up and come home and tell us what was happening with her. And we'd all exchange whatever was happening with us. And um, it was, we enjoyed learning about the other parts of the world and what they, their belief system was. And whenever she went anywhere, she always came back with all these wonderful tales to tell us. You know. Now, so you're, you're a grown up yourself and right. your mom's on this spiritual right. odyssey. Right. You didn't think, hmm, how come only my mom is out there in <laughs> India searching for truth? You know, we, we were sharing our mother since we were kids, you know? And we enjoyed sharing her with people. We felt so blessed to have her that we thought, oh, let's share her with everyone, you know? And, and that was our attitude about it, you know, share her with whatever. And I know uh, she was lecturing at one point at um, um, UCLA, and this young student got up and, and in the auditorium and said, excuse me, Mrs. Viri, trying to be smart like all students are. And he said, I understand the Hawaiians are a dying race. And she says, let me come back to that after I finish my lecture. Okay. After the lecture, she said, all right, young man, I'll answer your question now. I prefer to think that the Hawaiians are not a dying race. They are very busy creating an international race. Take my little granddaughter here. Come here, Debbie. She says, this little girl is French, English, Spanish, Hawaiian, Japanese. She says, how more international can you get? She had a standing ovation. <laughs> But, you know, that's how she thought. And did she bring to you her aha moments, her epiphanies? Yes. We used to sit and have these discussions about what was happening in her life and what was happening in ours and how we were growing. And we, we, didn't, we didn't go out an awful lot. We didn't enjoy doing that. We, were, we liked to stay at home with the family. You know, we did a lot of things together. And, and she said it, she just learned that there's just not a big place in one's life for negativity. Yes. So she tried never to no. say anything bad. Uh, did she succeed at home? I mean, it's, Well, we it's had hard. our spankings and everything. I mean, if you want to call that negative. But, but, but could she be positive about so many things? Yes, yes, yes. It, it, she taught us to see only the good. And I have trouble with one child who only sees good and she will not see the other. I said, there is also something that is not good here. And you have to find a balance there. You know, you just can't see only good, 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 good. Because not everyone is, everyone is made up of the two. Do you think your mother saw the, the negative but, but chose not to acknowledge really? Yes, yes. That is non-acknowledgement of it. And uh, nullifies it. Are you that way too? Yeah, I think I. I uh, it sure takes away the petty things of life, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I, I know. I've sat one night and I said to myself, you know, Mom, I, I'm. This is very interesting. I talk to myself a lot at home <laughs> because I live alone and the children are in the other house. 
And I said, you know, it's interesting. I think I have gone past you now spiritually, you know, where you were in my journey. Uh, you, you picked up the baton. And yes, then. yes, yes. And I said, which for me is very interesting. You know, I, I think I've passed you. Nanny, nanny, <laughs> nanny. <laughs> How do you think you've passed her? What, in what ways have you been able to grow? I've really been able to put what she spoke of into action, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, I have found that it works in so many areas in my life, you know, and of course I think one of the biggest areas is the financial area, <laughs> that I've been able to, you know, make that work for me. So I, I, I always say, hey, mom, I think I've gone past you, ha uh ha. -huh. Because she never mastered her finances? No, no, because um, um, I've learned so much more since she's been gone just by, by uh, going inward and, and you know, uh, trying to go, taking the baton and go further with it, mm -hmm. see how much further I can get. Because the world has changed an awful lot since she's been in it. And uh, you have to make changes. You have to make changes. Nana Viri, Emma Viri's mother, attracted many people to her through her welcoming personality. She even drew the interest of tobacco heiress Doris Duke, who called young Emma Tita, a Hawaiian word for sister, and whom Nana and Emma affectionately called Lahi Lahi, a Hawaiian word for fragile. Nana Viri and Doris Duke seemed an unlikely duo, but the two bonded in friendship, traveling and searching for universal truths together. How does your How mom, did they meet? who is the lifeguard okay. matron at the natatorium, yes. okay. meet this she, heiress, Doris Duke? She was at a little dinner party at Lao Yi Chai, the old Lao Yi Chai. And she was there, I think she might have been there with Daddy Bray. We should say that Daddy Bray was a fully credentialed kahuna. Kahuna, yes, yes. And, and he loved Mom. They used to get together all the time. And um, so he called Mom after the party, and he said, you know, uh, Miss Duke wants to meet you. <laughs> and Mother said, Daddy, she said, I have so many friends already. I don't need any more. <laughs> and why did Doris Duke seek out your mother? Well, they sat across from each yeah. other. That's all that Mo happened, Mother right? was just a very interesting lady. Um, um, people looked at her and wanted to be her friend. It just was it a charisma? I guess because a lot of people wanted to have be acquainted and and, and uh, develop a relationship. Not with knowing her. anything else about her, no, they yes, wanted to know yes. her. Yes, but um, she and mother had some crazy, crazy Wait, times. They traveled the world together. I think mother went around the world with her three times, and Why? of course this was wonderful. Was because this just a vacation? Well, she she loved India and she'd always go to India, but they would go all over the world and um, um, mother would be seeking and she'd go right along with mother and, and you know, uh, just see what mom's up to. And what, what did your mom find as in her search? Oh, she went to a lot of places, but mother was always seeking, finding different places to go to, spiritual places, to learn about the religion of the place and um, uh, just trying to incorporate it into what would work for her. So it, it's kind of an international thing that she was trying to create for herself, a spiritual, uh, uh, what is it? Her spiritual journey was trying to get all of these religions and make them work together as one. A, a, a few times on these trips, she she said her intuition saved her yes. life and that of Doris Yes, 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 yes. She told me about that. It was interesting things happening that way. You know. Did you experience that from her when you were a, a child? Did she seem to know, uh, have intuition well, or psychic ability? Interesting. My sister had it, and I had it, and I have it, but I don't use it. I don't use it at all. Um, but we were all kind of, we all saw, but I, I always tell my mother and, and her, I said, you know, my, my so-called, for lack of a better word, ministry is music. Mm -hmm. I said, I sing, I heal through singing. I, mm -hmm. you know, I, that's my calling and that's what I love to do. So I leave that all to you guys and, you know, do my thing. There were many people who were attracted to your mother's 
um, personality or yes, abilities. Yes. Um, who are some of the others who are well known? Doris Duke, you mentioned Jackie Kennedy? Oh yeah, well Jackie came and, and was a friend of Doris's and my children kind of grew up down at Shangri-La with La Auntie Lahi. And so it got to the point where every time uh, when Jackie met the two children, my two daughters, she asked if they wouldn't play with John John and Caroline. So Robin became John John's buddy. She took care of John John. And Noe, Kathy, became Caroline's friend. So this went on for a number of years. Whenever they'd come over, Jackie would call me and say, Emma, this is Jackie. I said, I heard you were in town. She said, can I borrow your two beautiful daughters? I said, fine, you know, and they'd go. And I never really met her till months, till years later when I was in New York. And because I, I don't like to push my, you know, I don't ordinarily tell everybody my last name, just so I want to be normal. I don't want to be that lady that's up there somewhere because the whole attitude of your relationship changes. So does that mean you didn't um, enjoy the star treatment when everybody knew your name here and, and was I, familiar I, with your work? I, and I'm me. <laughs> You know, I, I, it's nice that somebody says, you know, but I get, embar I get embarrassed. <laughs> I still do get embarrassed when people say, oh, you're, and I've actually been out sometimes, and if I look, if you pardon the local expression, junk, no makeup, goofy, right? Somebody will say, you know, you look just like, I'll say, you know, they tell me that all the time. Thank you so much. I'm so flattered, and I'll walk away. <laughs> And whoever is with me says, why did you do that? I said, oh, because I look junk. <laughs> <laughs> Both Emma and her mother, Nana Viri, were well-known figures in Hawaii, and they shared many of the same sensibilities, going back to Nana's traditional Hawaiian upbringing. As was common in those days, Nana was Hanai, adopted. She was raised by her grandmother, whom she called her mother, and Nana spoke the Hawaiian language of her elders. In those days, it was the old Hawaii and the old Hawaiian language, which was rich in metaphors, and the missionaries came along and changed that. Yes, well, you know, even, even the pronunciation. Mother, when she spoke Hawaiian, it was, it was melodious, and it was soft and gentle. You know, I'd hear her talk, and I'd hear someone else talk, and it was like a different language. You know, it was klakaua. Klakawa, kuhio, you know, but soft, not guttural like they do today. You know, it was, it was just a... Uh, Did you grow up speaking fluent Hawaiian? We weren't allowed to speak Hawaiian at that time in the schools. They weren't allowed to speak Hawaiian at all. Could you understand so your mother I never, and father? I could understand, but I could never speak yet. Uh, we never learned, and then mother taught Hawaiian later on, but we were grown up and had families, so we didn't really learn, and I've always felt like felt terrible about that, but when I heard that Auntie Nona didn't speak Hawaiian, I felt good. I said, okay. <laughs> it was the I'm, time. Okay, yes, and she said the same thing. They weren't allowed to, to speak mm -hmm. Hawaiian, you know. I know oh, you know this yes. book well. If I could just point your attention to this part where your mom writes, the language is a riddle, speaking of the Hawaiian yes, language. Yes. Um, before the missionaries came and converted the language into the written word, mm -hmm. the Hawaiians used figures of speech and language yes. that was like poetry. Right. I was fortunate, she says, to be taught to speak Hawaiian in the old way. Mm -hmm. My mother taught me to speak the language softly without saying anything negative or elaborating. Leave the details out, she said, and speak softly. Speak softly, so beautiful. Well, you know, it's like the heavens weep and the earth flourish. That's how you said it was raining. Now that is how poetic and how beautiful, you know, and it was, just beautiful to, to hear her talk. And why leave the details out? What was the, what was the point of being instructed? You know, leave the details yeah, out. You waste a lot of energy with detail sometimes, you know? Um, it's unnecessary, you get to the point, get where you're going without all the little stuff in between. You know, as, as, as people age, I, I thought, and maybe I'm wrong, right. I thought change became harder to navigate. And, and maybe the truth is it's human nature to, um, to resist change, <laughs> but not, not for your mom. She said, 
I let changes take place in my life. I know they must, and I know they will. I accept all change as a spiritual adventure and begin the discovery of God in every new condition. Right. Yes, That's yes. saying a, a, a great deal because right. there's so many things that are hard to let go of. Right, right. And of course, one of her things is let go of all negativity. Do not give them power. And that's a big one. That's a biggie. And I've, I've been working very hard on that one. <laughs> and I think I've, I've done pretty good with it. And um, she says, from the highest peak of my consciousness, I look down upon the nothingness of things and see instead the beauty of God in all, for He is all. And I think that I, I love that. I absolutely love that. And you know from her life that those aren't just words. Yes, she lived it. She lived it. And I've tried, I've tried to live by that, by what she taught me. And it works. It does work. Emma Veery is a treasure filled with surprises, kind of like a box of chocolates. Mahalo to Emma and to you for joining me to share stories from a remarkable life in Hawaii on Long Story Short. And thank you too to those who've written us notes expressing appreciation for our efforts to inspire viewers through quality programs on PBS Hawaii. I'd like to express my appreciation to you for your support and encouragement. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Ahoy ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. One day I was sitting around and someone called and said, uh, you know, I am a healer from New Hampshire and your mother comes to me all the time. And I sat in my little cottage and I said, Mom, you go and see everybody around the world. How come you're not coming to see me? <laughs> and I could just hear her laughing and say, my dear, you had me all of those years. You know, <laughs> let me go. <laughs> but you think she's still a presence? Well, she, I, she has a presence to a lot of people and, you know, that we're not aware of. But people will meet me and say, you know what? Nana has come to me and I go, oh, do, 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 do. Here we go, you know. <laughs>